Warning, this is a long, hard test. I have lots of past AP questions on works that remained on the list and lots of new questions from the College Board and other sources that address the new curriculum's modernist works. So we're dividing the test into two days to give you a fighting chance. The first day will be a combined short essay and image-based test. Now, we're going to let you choose between two actual College Board essays from the new curriculum. One question deals with this work, and it's pretty straightforward, but you need to know which important events in Mexican history the painting depicts. Not all of them, but some of the highlights. What the artist was trying to say about his country's history, who his audience was, and how they responded, and most importantly, and I think this is also the hardest part, why his audience responded the way they did. Most of you have not studied much Mexican history, and we were moving pretty fast by the end of the unit. So this one may require some boning up. I think it would be well worth doing. Your second choice is an attribution question, and I'm giving you a huge help by showing you the work in advance. I don't think it's actually a very tough attribution, but as always with this kind of question, you then have to give two identifiers for the required work by the same artist, and really one of these has to be the artist since it is, in fact, an attribution question. You also have to justify your attribution with specific visual evidence from both works. Don't forget to use the work that's actually in front of you on the test, but you need to have some visual memory of the other required work by the same artist. Finally, and this is the most important and the trickiest part, you have to talk about how the works both demonstrate the artist's ongoing experimentation with form using landscapes as the means of experimenting with forms, particularly geometric forms. Now, I talked about this artist and his required work more in my podcast than I did the one you just saw, but it's not an easy question. Neither of these is an easy question. Come prepared and you'll do fine. What really gets ugly about this unit is we start breaking down our dates by decades. These dates are rough estimates, really, because works in various categories sometimes extend a few years on either end, but it should serve as a start to help you keep this straight. I'm not going to talk about these next few slides, just offer them as a resource. Okay, you need to know the two artists, where they come from, that may be trickier for the one on the left, so know that, and the movements with which they are associated. Be careful with this last part. I'll give you a big hint about the work on the right. The movement includes the name of the city where he worked. By the way, the artist of the work on the right was influenced by what form of art? Again, think lots of gold. So what historical movement does the artist on the left come from? That's actually a hard question. He's surprisingly early, though not as early as Impressionism. His paintings have a surrealist feel, but surrealism won't come around until after World War I, and this is a work from 1893. So, what late 19th century school focused on inner vision rather than outward reality? I included the answer in the section on dates. What are both artists interested in? And by the way, it was a big preoccupation in Klimt's hometown and of one of its famous local heroes, Sigmund Freud. That shouldn't be hard. Both artists would be considered. Now, the answer is a much more general term, although it's one I've talked about. It was one that's in your reading. It's borrowed from the military. It's a term that means marching ahead, a, a corps that goes ahead of the rest of the troops, often as scouts. Who's the painter? What are his interests? What historical event does he portray in this series? The name of the series gives it away. In this particular panel from the series, your required work, how does the artist achieve a unified composition? Does it use atmospheric perspective? Well, I don't see any blurring or lightening of color as the background proceeds. What about sfumato, S-M-U-M-A-T-O? Nope. The forms are very crisp edged, unlike, say, the Mona Lisa, which does use sfumato, ah, hard word to say, which is particularly associated with Leonardo da Vinci. Is it bilaterally symmetrical? That's tougher because that line through the middle does create a kind of division into two halves, but notice that they are not of equal size, and the one on the left has only two figures, the one on the right has more. Um, but note that the artist uses repeating forms, both in the birds 
and in the triangular shapes of, oops, I, that's a reference to an older version I used, in the triangular shapes of the body. In fact, these are highly geometric, almost like cutouts. So do you remember the term for repeating forms? It's rhythm. Anyway, I just gave you the answer. Also, what is the message of this particular panel? What social reality, what historical social reality is the artist trying to capture? So this is no longer required work, but I've hung on to some old questions about it since Ms. Jacobs and I required this painting and because it's so representative of its school and so famous. Know the school and what preoccupied artists of the school. What theorists especially influenced their work? I don't think you'll find these questions tough. Oh, this building is a past and present College Board favorite. You'll see a lot of questions on this work on both of your tests. It's one you really need to know. So what is this building? Where is it located? What style is this building? And what characterizes this style? Now, I went through the architect's major design elements. There were five in my architecture podcast. If you missed class that day, here's a plea. Watch that lecture. Pay special attention to the architect's attitude toward new technology and building materials. There are a couple of slogans associated with the school. One, they borrowed from Lewis Sullivan, and it employs alliteration. There's a test of how well you know your literary terms. The other slogan is associated with this architect who saw buildings as blank for blank. Fill in those blanks and you will understand a lot about modernist architecture as well as getting that question right. By the way, to answer this and other questions, you need to know what a cantilever is. I'll give one big hint. This house doesn't have any, and falling water does. Tall skyscrapers like the Seagram Building also had cantilevers, but they were part of the internal skeleton. Basically, they helped hold the floors up, which made those buildings less reliant on an outer skeleton and allowed them to have the kind of glass curtain walls that are so characteristic of buildings such as the Seagram Building. Okay, this wasn't required work either, but it's very famous and it's an earlier work by the architect who designed Falling Water. And I think there are real similarities, particularly in the geometric shapes and in the orientation to the site. So really, this is an attribution question. So here's another famous now non-required work of art that I talk about in my architecture podcast. It's the headquarters of the Bauhaus School. What was that school known for? What characteristic did its founders believe buildings should have and big hint not have? And by the way, it remains important in this course, even if the Bauhaus school was somewhat puzzlingly eliminated, Mies van der Rohe and Le Corbusier were both very influenced by the Bauhaus ethos. So what style is this? I just really told you who, what it was going to be. And you should be able to answer this even without knowing the work. So, who's the painter? I know his work is no longer required either, but it's very distinctive and very important to the history of art. So I basically want you to know the name, and here's why. And a second question. What color theorists heavily influenced this artist and other post-impressionists and really expressionists as well after them, really all artists after them? Now, I talked about this in my post-impressionist podcast, and it's in your readings as well. What art historical period or style is this work associated with? What are the intentions of the artist? And by the way, that's a tougher question. Uh, what your homework reading said about his style is that Mondrian believed that his art revealed the underlying eternal structure of existence and gave viewers access to universal truths. He's not a Freudian. These were not dreams. This was a link to what he saw as a true spiritual reality. It's worth reading this quote by Mondrian. It will help you answer a couple of questions on the test. Uh, you should also know, this is going to come up on your next test, that Mondrian's spiritual views were based on a rather obscure and complicated philosophy known as theosophism. Down to earth, what's the date of the painting? That's an old question, but you may get dates on the new exam as well. Uh, and you certainly may sometimes need them for identifiers. So that's why I've included all those pesky date slides. Who's the artist of this work and what school does he belong to? You need to know the term, or I think you should know the term in both English and German, or at least be able to recognize the German term. It's not hard. Since his work is quite distinctive, you should be prepared for an attribution question about this artist as well. So what group, again, does this artist belong to? 
Remember that this artist thought that his colors were connected to music and that both had deep spiritual significance. Uh, this is in many ways a depiction from the book of Revelation. Note the resemblance in this regard, that is, in the focus on spirituality and a fundamentally fairly positive outlook that good triumphs over evil, uh, similarity to the painter you just saw. Well, now with these uh, combination works, we get to review some of our older works. What was the central message of the work on top, which was back uh, from the Wars of Religion? Why did both artists choose the print form? What kinds of prints are these? What technique is used? And what kind of figures does this technique tend to produce, at least if you're not Albrecht Durer, who could do anything in every medium? Another way of thinking about this is what limitations does this particular print technique impose? Why was the work on the bottom created? What event is being commemorated? So here's another comparative pair across units. What genre are both of these paintings? That one should be easy. When were both works produced? And what school did the artist of the work on the right belong to? One influence on the second later painting that doesn't show up in the first is... That's the question. Well, I talked about this in my podcast, and I'm dropping some very big pins, uh, hints here. Remember that Matisse loved patterns, especially, especially textile patterns, and he looked at patterns from North Africa and Asia in particular. The general multiple choice test is a lot longer and, in my view, quite hard. That test review will be up next. <laughs>